Hello, my name is Gisela and I am a PhD student at the University of Nottingham. In this presentation, I will be talking about our paper Reframing Disability as Competency, Unpacking Everyday Technology Practices of People with Visual Impairments. This is work done in collaboration with Joel Fisher and Stuart Reeves. So in this presentation, I will briefly talk about our research motivation and our ethnomethodological approach. Then I will recap the ethnographic study that I conducted and I will present and unpack one example from our data that will help to illustrate what we mean by reframing disability as competency. Research at the intersection between HCI and assistive technology has long studied the design, development and evaluation of technologies to assist and support people with visual impairments through their experiences and for improving their quality of life. Despite this and other efforts beyond HCI, people with visual impairments still experience physical, social, and accessibility barriers in their everyday lives. Complicating matters regarding assistive technology is the fact that there are differences between and within groups of people with visual impairments that consequently affect their use of technologies. For example, people with low vision and people who are blind, and these differences are not always acknowledged by design. So in this paper, we are building on prior work that has investigated the use of a range of devices, software, and internet applications by people with visual impairments in their everyday activities. These studies have found and confirmed continuing accessibility challenges. Other work has also investigated the role of these technologies in social and professional interactions, highlighting the social embeddedness of assistive technologies. The creation and maintenance of accessible environments has also been explored, and these studies have found that people with visual impairments employ a range of strategies or workarounds for adapting and overcoming issues encountered. Lastly, our work also builds on calls for centering design on ability rather than disability, but in here we move away from measuring ability in terms of performance or accuracy. And we do this by employing ethnomethodology, which has a particular emphasis on situated competencies. We suggest that ethnomethodology has much to bring to re research on disability and visual impairments. In our work, instead of articulating visual impairments as problematic or emphasizing locating barriers, we are more interested in uncovering just how participants practically accomplish mundane everyday activities in much the same way that anyone must get on with things. Ethnomethodology uses the term mundane to emphasize that such practices are thoroughly remarkable to people. So in this paper, we explore three main, three main points. First, what ethnomethodology can offer for assistive technology research by examining the thoroughly practical, mundane activities of people with visual impairments. Then, the practices in which mainstream and assistive technologies are present. And lastly, the competencies that people display while conducting them. So for this study, I conducted four months of ethnographic fieldwork with members of a charity that support people with visual impairments. First, there was an initial stage of research immersion comprised by taking training for volunteers and also um, by attending several group meetings. This was both for building rapport and for recruiting participants for one-on-one -on -one sessions. As a result, 11 participants took part in interviews, seven men and four women. They were aged between 28 and 93 years old. All participants identified as legally blind, but they all had different eye conditions, 
For example, some were completely blind and others were partially sighted. All participants were interviewed at home or at the charity about their everyday activities and their te technology use within them. And observations were also conducted with 10 of these participants. Data was collected using a mix of field notes, photos, audio, and video recordings. And across the practices of all 11 participants, treatment sites were identified that feature the use of mainstream and assistive technologies. We found that for our participants, phones and computers act as crucial facilitators to their social relations and communications practices. And various aids and technologies are used by them for textual reading and mobility practices, but to different extents. Participant also told us in interviews and observations that a primary method for textual reading is to request assistance from others. In our paper, we argue that this is not something necessarily problematic, but it's part of their way of moving on with their activity. I won't go into too much detail about all of this. Instead, I will only present and unpack one of the fragments from our paper to illustrate the work we've done. And I invite you, of course, to read our paper to get, to get more information. So I'm going to present this fragment um, where a blind participant demonstrates her use of her mobile phone for text messaging. This participant, along with most people who are blind, uses the screen reader that is built into the mobile phone. And broadly, what a screen reader does is to convey text and information as synthesized speech. Screen reader users are very familiar with listening to the speech, and thus they configure it to go at very fast rates. So in this clip, this blind participant was asked to show the various uses of her mobile phone. She was just about to demonstrate the apps on it, but before showing the first one that was the text messaging app, she adjusted the speech rate of the screen uh, of the screen reader because it normally goes very fast. So this is this adjustment is what what we're about to see. So on the, the first page I have messages. I just put the speed down so you can hear it as well. <clears throat> so from this short clip we can observe different types of competencies that the participants have the participant has showcased. This includes um, listening to the synthesized speech at a very fast rate, as I already mentioned, but also show her complex gestural muscle memory to adjust the speech rate. And she engaged in this set of interactions that were produced in the span of four seconds. The clip also shows how the participant has configured the device to be adapted to her particular preference and lastly, it shows how she had to adjust the assistive technology for engaging in this particular social interaction. So now I will show another clip from the same fragment, where after opening the messaging app, the participant has opened uh, one conversation, and then she proceeded to explain the process of writing a text message. So now I opened your um, text. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do, I can find the compose box. Message. Text message. It's a uh, message, text message. So I'm going to double tap on this. Message. Space. Delete. Return. So now I'm on the box where I can, I can I've got keyboards open. So mm -hmm. I can type in. Catch A. Cap H. So on the. Uh, like, any. Cap S. Cap C. Cap N. Any key. Cap Return. 
delete. So I mean, whatever letter I, I mean, whatever letter I put my finger on, it will read out the letters. So in this clip, we observe how she locates elements on the screen, displaying knowledge of the screen layout, recalling the location of visual elements, in this case, the composed box and the space bar, both at the bottom of the screen. Later, we observe how she explored the keyboard, coupling touch with the audio output from each key pressed. So to recap, what we have observed in this fragment is that the participant um, shows auditory competencies by how she listens to the fast speech. Also, she has showed her tactile competencies while exploring the touchscreen surface and how um, she operates the shortcuts and the gestures uh, very proficiently. We have also observed her cognitive competencies by um, how she recalled the location of the element of the screen. And lastly, we've seen her configuration competencies to adjust the device to her own particular preference. So in the paper, we have unpacked other fragments from our corpus in a similar way to what I've showed you today. And we have outlined our participant sets of competencies in, this, um, in a similar table that contains auditory, spatial, tactile, verbal, cognitive, social, adaptation, and configuration competencies. In the paper, you can find more data that links to all of these competencies we have listed. Naturally, other research has, has explored some of these competencies to different extents. But our contribution here is to characterize the participants' abilities beyond what's functional, beyond the sensory and the cognitive. Our view, for example, does not preclude requesting assistance from others, but rather recognizes it as part of the participants' own methods employed in their everyday activities. We have also included competencies in the form of adaptation and configuration because there is definitely some work behind these that specifically align to participants' own conditions and experiences. So in conclusion, in shifting our um, emphasis from disability as a problem more towards unpacking practical action, we have provided descriptions of just how participants move on in their everyday lives involving technology. Our main contribution lies in our stance to recognize and uncover competency in disability by centering our emphasis on what people can do. By employing an ethnometodological orientation, our findings highlight how participant, participants' competencies comprise more than their visual condition. In this paper, we have provided a complementary approach to current frameworks and paradigms in HCI and assistive technology research. We suggest that developing an awareness of these competencies could be used by both designers and researchers as another starting point for future work that investigates people's abilities and how they could be supported or extended. This, in contrast to approaches that emphasizes locating accessibility barriers and building technological solutions for removing them. So overall, we propose that this view can enrich the design of assistive and mainstream technologies. Thank you. Uh, just before ending this, I want to mention that this work is supported by Conacyt and the EPSRC. Thank you for your attention.